We only get one chance at life, and we are all dealt a different hand of cards. But it's not about what happens to you, it's about how you respond. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, Mike Cohen. Mike is a cancer survivor, a heart transplant recipient, and an ultra endurance athlete. This is a very deep conversation, and I'm very happy that you get to hear it. Check it out. All right, well, thank you, Mike, for meeting with me today and let me interview interview you about your story. You have such an incredible story, and I'm so excited about the listeners to be able to hopefully not hear it for the first time, but if it is our first time, they are going to be blown away. So first off, I want to ask you about something else I learned about you from interacting with you. And that's that you work at Canyon. And so you work at the headquarters. And so what's that like? First off, thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, I've been I've been following you for a while. And I I saw you started having a podcast. I'm like, I'd like to be on and share my story. But um, yeah, so uh, working at Canyon, uh, it's it's a dream. So I actually started with them um, as an ambassador first. I had just finished my cross country bike ride and um, I was looking to partner with a bike manufacturer company in some capacity. And um, I had reached out to a friend of mine that had set me up. He was like, okay, you know, I can get you in touch with this company, this company, this company. And who would you like to be, you know, like who you're most interested in, in getting in touch with. And um, Canyon was definitely on my list. I had, I had followed them for years and, Um, so yeah, I mean, I was given the introduction to them and I, I sent over my, my pitch, my deck over and, um, out of the three, um, companies that I reached out to with the identical setup, uh, same email, same message, just obviously a a couple tweaks here and there. Um, within 24 hours, I received an email back from Blair Clark, the CEO of Canyon USA. And no way. with, yeah, within that time frame, I'm like, okay, like, you know, before it was a decision made, he's like, we would love to have you. Your story is something that is unique and, and could really benefit anybody that hears it. And that's really when it started, but it wasn't, it was beginning of 2021. So it was right after the first full year of the pandemic. And so there was so many questions and like, where are you going to get the bike? Like, like, when is the bike coming? Um, I had bikes that I, that were completely off brand. And I'm like, I don't want to keep riding these bikes if I have this, the disagreement, you know, with Canyon. So I'm like, I, I didn't ride for a while because of that. I'm like, let me wait. And then eventually I ended up getting my road bike from them. And then they ended up giving me a gravel bike as well. So those are currently the bikes that I ride and I've been an ambassador with them since then. And then, um, last November, um, they were looking for someone to work in the showroom and I have a lot of sales experience and I, figuring like what better way to get better at being an ambassador than learning more about what I'm, what I'm writing and being able to share my story in the same capacity and uh, ended up getting that position. And I've been there for a year now and it's an absolute dream. It's, you know, you see, you, you, like you walk around all day long and it's in the showroom. So you see all the bikes that you want and, you know, I have some of them, I get to ride r- pretty much whatever demos we have and being around the environment of just people coming and going of constantly inspiring me and, anybody that works there. I mean, if you're not a, if you're not a bike, you know, fanatic in some, in some way, um, <laughs> you got to recheck yourself, but I am, <laughs> I, every day I walk in, I'm like, I can't believe I work here. Um, it's an amazing, it's an incredible experience. Yeah. Cause I, uh, I interviewed your coworker from Germany, Sarah Wilsman Reisman, and she's okay. like the head of user experience. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about Canyon and I'm like, that is so amazing. And I couldn't imagine having your role because I would either be in debt <laughs> or it'd be terrible for me to see all those bikes and just be able to buy them right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's crazy because we get to see the bikes. We don't get too much before before the consumers do, but it's um, it's cool to have and touch them and learn about them and, you know, really, really like learn the in the ins and outs behind the reasons of decisions that they make. Um, obviously all that stuff is, is considered embargo and is considered obviously protected by, um, you know, contracts, but it's just amazing to be a part of it and see it and read it and learn about it and, and then see it being used in, in the wild, you know, at races, like, like we just released the new ultimate, which was, you know, won a stage at the Vuelta, which also was used in 
the UCI World Gravel Championships and podium oh, nice. two spots. So it's like this is our road bike, but we just rode, we just won a gravel world championship. Yeah. We put bike. thicker tires it's on very, knobs it's and cool. go. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like what could you fit stiffen in there? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so crazy. That's awesome. And so yeah. you kind of mentioned something cool, which you kind of get to hear why they made the decisions that they did for that right. bike and stuff. And that's always so fascinating to me because that's why I brought Sarah on too, because yeah. I wanted to know, from the website aspect, especially dealing with the bike boom that you were discussing of like, mm-hmm. well, why did you make the website like that? Because yeah. you had to, she was explaining that you had to tailor the website to not only people who are avid cyclists, but people who were kind of new cyclists in the pandemic and how you can kind of bridge the gaps and make a website that's good enough for both parties. So it was kind of, it was really fascinating. Yeah, no, um, um, that's a great point because what Canyon's doing currently, at least in the U.S., um, I would say, I mean, obviously it all, it all stemmed from Germany, but the structure of it has completely changed the industry. I mean, to have access to, well, first off, if you have the access to come to the showroom, it's, it's not a, it's not a sales process, which makes the entire uh, experience of going to the showroom, like, like, like not salesy. Like you're, like, you're not going to feel the same way as if you walk into a bike shop, you know, we don't have to sell what we have on the floor. We can't sell what we have on the floor. So it's, it makes it easy because then we're just educating. We're, we're really listening to why they're choosing that bike. We're listening to what they're looking to achieve. And it really allows us to dial in specifically like what would fit best for them. Um, you know, certain, certain upgrades that we could, we could recommend down the road. And it doesn't hurt that the price points are, are very reasonable. And it's, it's very, it's very hard for people to compete with us. And I don't think it has to be a competition when you have something that's really a bike product that's solid. Um, it's backed by incredible warranty. You, you, we, we have success through almost every discipline of cycling. Um, you know, there's, there's very little to not like about Canyon as a, as a brand and especially their athletes, like everybody's inspiring. It's, it's cool. It's really cool. I'm very grateful. Yeah, absolutely. And that, I mean, those are the best experiences too, when you're trying to find something, especially because bikes are so expensive anyway, especially if you want to get something that's durable, but to go in and not be like, well, I feel like they're just talking to me because it's based off of commission, but to have right. a conversation to be like, okay, well, let's make this educational. What are you looking for? This 100%. is what we have. We actually can't sell anything to you. So we can right. only inform you about our products. Like that's a exactly. great experience. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's so awesome. But so I guess the, not the main reason, but the key point to this episode is your story. And that's what I really want to emphasize because it's just so amazing. And it's just hearing about it. It blew me away. And I keep having guests on the podcast and I'm like, their story is so amazing. I like, it's just so wild. And then yours is the same way. Like it just, I mean, it's so it's difficult. It's tough. It's like it's overwhelming, but also there's joy in it too. And like mm-hmm. overcoming and strength and stuff. So I just want to open up the floor to you just to be able to share your story. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, over the years, I'm, I'm 37 years old and I'm, the fact that I'm here, the fact that I'm in this capacity, the fact that I work at a bike shop and can ride the bikes that are at a bike shop, at not bike shop, a bike manufacturer, <laughs> um, is it, it, like every day, like I, I, I pinch myself, like I wake up, my, my road bike is right next to me. <laughs> um, like, trust me, like, like this, this process is, has taken a long time. And to be able to share the story um, as a healthy man, as, as a former patient, um, I'm starting to see my title starting to change. Uh, I feel like I'm less of a former patient and I'm working towards to be more of an athlete. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to, to shed that title, uh, because I forever have to live a certain way because of what I've experienced. And so, uh, it just makes that, dis- that, that decision to go on a bike ride that much more valuable. Like every pedal is towards a reason, like every, every scar, every experience that I have is I try to channel it through my rides. I try to channel it through that time that I get to just kind of be silent and I'm by myself and I don't do, I don't do group rides. I don't do, um, I don't really race within the Peloton. <laughs> I don't race at all. Um, 
you know, I mean, I did the, the last best ride this year and they, they came out with a really, really good, uh, let's call it a slogan. You know, people are, some people are there to compete and some people are there to complete. And I feel that it's, it just, it hits everybody. And for me, so my story starts, uh, when I was 18 years old, I was going to culinary school in New York city and, my trajectory was going to be, I was doing really well at culinary and I was going to be a, um, I was going to be on the food network. I was really good at cooking and uh, the culinary school that I was going to, they were in this process of trying to be, make it more marketable. Uh, they were trying to put on some sort of production that looked like, like the best teen chef of America. And so there was these little competitions that were at local universities and colleges that would, what they had. And, um, I had competed and I fell in love with cooking, wasn't a big student, didn't really like studying. I really was more of like a hands-on learner. Uh, my dad was a carpenter. So like everything was like, like hands-based, but my dad was like, you're not being a carpenter. <laughs> you're going to go to school. Like, you're going to get a, you know, education. But I, I mean, I had a really bad stuttering problem when I was younger too. So that was like, okay, like, let me use my, my hands and my creativity to be my voice at the time. And so at that time I, was going to school in New York city. I was living in long Island. So it's about an hour commute uh, to and from. And I remember walking to work one day on my day off and um, I had, I had lumps underneath my throat, just, just like, like, what is going on here? And I had some phlegm and I, I spit it out and it was, it was snowing and it was dark. So I was like, what's going on? It's, it was all blood. Like I, like I looked at my hands, it's all blood. I walked to to my job, which was just a couple hundred feet away. And she saw that I had blood all over my mouth. And she's like, you need to go home. She's like, you can't work like this. And like, I was bad. Like, like I could not breathe. I was congested. I, everything was just not good. And I remember going home that night and my mom gave me tea and she's like, you know, when your dad comes home, we'll take you to the hospital. And, um, I woke up in the middle of the night with excruciating pain, like shooting pain coming from, uh, the inside part where I thought was my heart, I thought I was having a heart attack and it was my spleen enlarged, which I didn't know until I got to the hospital. But, um, my dad ran upstairs, picked me up, put me in a car. We went to a local hospital. Uh, at that point they were trying to triage me. So to try to figure out what was going on. And they had determined that I, um, had some form of cancer, uh, just based upon my initial, uh, I guess, symptoms as they were seeing. And I just remember they were, they were working on me. All of a sudden I felt like a jab in my arm and the nurse comes over and she bends down to one knee and she's like, you're going to feel better now. And I did <laughs> like it, like all the pain that I had went away and I'm like, all right, let's go. It's time to go home. <laughs> and then I just heard like, like this doctor that was in the corner of the room talking to my mom. She then, and, and he said something like cancer and we had lost my grandmother, my, my grandmother a couple months before um, to cancer. So cancer was very sensitive in my family and very to me because I was close to my grandparents and I just passed out. I, I, I just passed out. And so next day I woke up, you know, in that, that nightmare situation where you look up and everything's white and you're like, Oh, I'm, am I dead? <laughs> you know, is this over or, or was that a bad nightmare? And it wasn't, I woke up and I was living the nightmare. My mom was at the foot of my bed and, um, she saw that I woke up. I had, I had uh, life support in my nose. I had um, I had all these uh, these IVs in my hands and my elbows. They had some. They had IVs in my legs. I'm like, what? Like I had I I I I'd never gone through something like this before. So it was all like, I'm like, what is going on? And um, my mom had confirmed to me. She's like, you are di you have cancer. And um, my dad walked in. My my younger brother, who's four years younger than me, walked in. And that was when I lost any composure that I had. They're like, you're not going to school anymore. You're not going to culinary school. Um, you, the only thing you're going to be doing is focusing on your treatments. And so at that point I was transferred to a local hospital that was more specific to my type of cancer in New York. And I had started the process of getting ready for chemotherapy. So, which was diagnosis. Um, and then they had to figure out what type of treatment would be the best um, for, for what I had at the, at the age I was, cause I was 18, but I was a bigger 18 year old cause I was, in, I was in good shape. So I was, I was a little heavier. So they treated me as an adult. 
Um, but I was also 18. So it was like almost like depending upon my weight and my muscle capacity, uh, they would potentially not treat me a certain way. So I feel that the treatments they, they ended up giving me ended up being a little heavier than, than, than a normal or another sized 18 year old. So yeah, that's that a cancer is, start. Yeah, that is, I mean, that is very heavy. Cause I mean, we actually, this year in Ju- July, we came back home, we moved across the country because my grandmother had terminal cancer and she actually passed away three weeks later after we moved back. Sorry and to hear like, that. Yeah. Thank you. And so anytime you hear the C word, it's very like kinds of pins and needles, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And it's just very heavy and it makes, I think every conversation more real Yeah. and not in the, obviously the best way. And so you obviously, <sighs> I mean, I want to know from your perspective, like once you heard that, what was your thought? Were you th- like, were you worried that maybe it was, they caught it too late or were you like, what were, what were the thoughts going through your head once you heard that you had cancer? So I was really, really mad um, because I had a, because I, because throughout school, like we are, my family originally was from Brooklyn. Like I'm a, I'm a city boy initially. And when you move from the city to a suburb in New York, um, like your life, it, it's a, it's a significant change. It's a significant change to pace. Um, like your local environments are different. And so when we moved out to Long Island, which is, which is a suburb of New York city, um, we moved there with, like, I had just, I just had finally got a group of friends, um, that I liked that, that we all got along. Like we, like we all hung out for like, like this, like for prom, we all, we all hung out. Like it was like the first group of friends that I had living in Long Island. I had most of my friends at that time was still living in Brooklyn. And so I was, I was kind of mad because I'm like, I finally have like a life that's in process. Like I finally figured out my, my, um, like my career path. I thought that something in culinary would be good. I was good at it. I, I liked it. And I felt very just, but also like w- with being so mad, I was almost like, I was, I was a pain in the, in the rear at that time. I was very stubborn. So I was also like, okay, let's do this. Like I had two, like I, like I had two very different perspectives on it. One was angry that like, I'm going to beat this because you, you're, cause you came out of nowhere to take this from me. I'm like, that's not going to happen. And I'm very stubborn. Like, like when you, like when you're from New York to a certain extent, there are some characteristics that either work against you or work for you. And I feel like for me, um, my, my mental strength was kind of got built based upon having that stutter for years and being made fun of by my, you know, my former classmates and so forth that it just like, I, I felt like inside myself, I'm like, there's nothing I can't do. So, but, but hearing the cancer, the, the word cancer for me was that attributed to me to losing my grandparents. So that also added more anger. Cause like they were, they were my best friends. They were very important parts of my life. Um, even to this day, the, the word of cancer still gives me chills. Like you said, like it's a, it's a very uncomfortable concept because now having two and a half years of experience of going from the absolute worst of losing every muscle in my body, legitimately not being able to walk up and down stairs without sitting on every single step. Like I was not strong enough to walk upstairs. My little brother, who's four years younger than me, physically lifted me out of the car and I had to walk with a cane because I literally did not have length of uh, strength in my legs. So now it's cancer is like a very it's more of how it affects other people than how it affects me. Um, the word cancer and the concept of cancer has literally destroyed my family in so many ways. Um, and obviously where I'm at now, everything that I've been through actually is attributed to cancer. The cancer started everything what ended up happening to me. So um, now it's more of like a trigger word. It's more like a, like, okay, like that's like, to me, to me, cancer is the absolute worst that I've ever had. Out of all that I've ever had, um, the chemotherapy experience is, in my opinion, the most um, inhumane experience that a, a person can go through. In person. Yeah, I know that from um, seeing both of my grandmas going through it, they, yeah. and other people, cause my, my father's a pastor up mm-hmm. in Boone. And so I've been around that kind of realm of like 
death and sick people a lot and from a very young age right and just seeing what the treatments are for cancer it is it's so brutal on your body like it's and i mean you can speak to this too because i mean i've never had to deal with it but i've just only seen it but it is so brutal and seeing how defeated people look when they get it and it just makes them so sick because it's pretty much like a poison in your body that's trying to attack the cancer but it's crazy that once again it's a poison that you're putting in your body like it's just i can't fathom it and then out the other side hopefully you come out without cancer like it's just a it's a crazy equation that i don't think people truly understand i mean i don't truly understand it either but it's just it's crazy and i think you had the right mentality like kind of going in being stubborn because i i feel like if you go into it and you're like i'm not going to take this laying down like i'm going to go in i'm going to fight this and we're going to kick its butt i definitely think you have the upper hand against cancer going into it with that that mindset i mean you hit the nail on the head I'm, i mean i would say personally i mean i i'm not a religious person i am very spiritual um, I'm very connected to, to my body and to my mind and to my heart, um, and to my, just my overall soul, because I feel I like, I truly believe that you, like you're given what you can take, what you could do. Um, you know, I feel that everybody has an adversity. I think everybody has some level of, um, you know, that weak point in their lives and chemotherapy, like you mentioned, and and especially specifically when I was going through it, so this is 2004. Um, the 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 amount of research that were in um, chemotherapy medications and, and treatments at that time were not as specific as they are now. So it would like what I would like to compare it to is like you're you like you're fighting. Um, you're pretty much fighting with napalm. Like you're just you're just lighting everything up. And like if anything survives whatever side effects that you've received from getting burnt up, um, your insides, your outsides, your hair, your, um, like, like, you know, your skin. Um, I mean, the pigmentation of your skin gets a weird greenish yellowish color. Your teeth get, you know, hurt. Um, I mean, I had, I had, um, I had like multiple ulcers in my throat like mm-hmm. from the chemotherapy. So I wasn't even able to eat. And so like, yeah, they, 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 there's just so much more negative than positive to chemo, but yeah, it's like, they hope, you know, they put it in there like, okay, well, you know, hopefully this works. And at, at this point, it seems like it's the only thing that does work. And obviously it worked enough for me, but with some issues at the end, <laughs> um, you know, in that process, but yeah, it's, 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 it's brutal. Um, cancer will always be a very, um, like that flare, like that thing that just stands out, um, forever in my battle, in my, in my story, in my trajectory. And, you know, it'll never, it'll never be subsided. Um, but I'm lucky enough to, as I'm further out, I could, I could shed that title of a cancer survivor. I mean, I'm, you know, 2004 to now is it's 18 years since my diagnosis and I've been cancer free since it's been 16 years. Um, which, you know, in this day and age, it could change. It can change any day. I mean, I'm ready for anything that comes my way. I mean, it'll be brutal if it happens again. Um, I'm pretty, pretty happy with, with how I'm taking my life with, with riding bikes and um, constantly keeping myself outside and engaging people and keeping positivity flowing through my veins and doing whatever I can to, to hopefully use the lessons that I've learned to share them with other people in similar age and mindsets and maybe not cancer, but, but life, I mean, adversity is adversity. Everybody, I feel that's the one unifying thing through every single person on this planet, you know, whatever color, whatever ethnicity, whatever religion, whatever background they are, we all go through something and, you know, some things are more intense than others. And some people like, Oh my God, FML. Like I wish, I wish I had someone else's life at the end of the day. You don't at the end of the day, you know, you have to be grateful for what you have and what you don't have and what you might have had and how you could potentially get it back. Like, that's my mindset. So, um, but cancer definitely led to a lot of other aspects of my life. And, um, 
to be honest with you, I wouldn't change a thing. Like, I, like if I had to choose to do it all over again, I would do it the same way of, of what I, what I've eventually gotten out of it, the, the lessons, the life lessons and the patience and the strength that I've gained over the years, I wouldn't do it a different way. I mean, I'm ready for, uh, I mean, you know, life is life, but I, I could deal with what's coming, whatever it is. Yeah. That's amazing. That's a great outlook on it too. Cause I mean, I don't know of a lot of people who've had cancer and be like, I would do it the same way, but that's, that's a very fantastic positive outlook on it. Thank you. But so your cancer, was it, you said that your both your grandparents passed, yeah. passed away from cancer. Yeah. And so was it hereditary or, or genetic or was it just kind of different? Um, yeah. So, um, so my grandmother had lymphoma, my grandfather had prostate cancer. And at this point, we're not exactly sure. We think it might be hereditary just because my grandmother had um, lymphoma, which is a subset of leukemia. But we're not sure at this point. Um, I mean, I, I never really took the time in my life to, to stop to be like, oh, my God, what happened? Like, I, I'm not that kind of person. I'm like, you know what? If this is what I have. I'm just going to deal with it. Let's go. You know? Yeah, that's great. I, th I think that's a great way you have to be, too. Yeah. It's only fair that way. It's, it, it's only fair to myself because I, like, I don't want to be one of those people that just live what if rather than it's more like, what can I do to make this better? Like, what could I contribute to this to make it more an easier pill for me to swallow? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a good analogy, but yeah, <laughs> no more pills, please. <laughs> yeah. And I think that doing that, like if you were to be like, Oh, well, what if, or, um, let me go back and see what happened. Like, yeah, you've already kind of moved past it yeah, and you've done it in a positive way. And so if you were to do that, maybe it might do yourself a disservice or be a negative attribute to all the positive things that you've already accomplished and pushed Without forward to. Agreed. And so I guess let's get into the next part of your story where, because you, is it a result of your cancer as to why you had, to receive a heart transplant? I finished my chemotherapy when I was 21 years old, um, last treatment. And at that point I was cancer free. I just started living. I'm like, okay, let's do, let's do whatever. Let's let's, I was living in San Diego at the time. I had started getting more into fitness. Um, I was starting to run more. Um, I wanted to start seeing what I could do now that I'm finally healthy as an, as an adult. So, um, I did a couple five K's. I did the San Francisco half marathon. Um, I did. Yeah, I ran, I ran stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I ran, um, I, I, I got more into not really surfing, but just more water sports. And, um, but then one random day I was at this this bar in um, in San Diego. It's called the Casbah. It's a it's pretty much like a live music venue, and so I'm there and like I didn't like the band, so I was sitting in the little courtyard, and they had that Forrest Gump on, and so I'm like, hmm, I'm like in my in my um, you know having a you know a beer, and I'm like, you know what? I think I think I'm gonna ride across the country. I think I'm gonna ride from where I finished my treatments in San Diego to where I started them in New York. And so the next day I got a text from my friend who had just um, opened up his own gym, his own like fitness studio. And he's like, I will train you. I will get you prepared. We can do this. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm running across the country now. <laughs> and, and so, so this, this idea came about from Forrest Gump. From Forrest Gump. The, <laughs> the scene so awesome. when he was running across the country. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, but the difference is I'm just not going to turn around and say, it's time to go home. <laughs> yeah. I'm just in the middle of going. Utah or somewhere. <laughs> in the yeah. middle of Utah. <laughs> and so, um, at that point I started training. I, I fell in love with the concept of building my body from absolutely nothing. I mean, like I said, I atrophied, I lost every muscle. And so we were dealing with 3,160 miles, um, on the same legs that, that had fully atrophied just not too long before that. So the first time I rode across the country was 3,168 miles. It was six years after my last chemo and it was in 38 days. So I averaged 97 miles a day. I think it was Wow, insane, insane. Like that, that that's what hooked me. 
like like right there that was when i'm like i love cycling i want to do something with this um i don't know what that means i was in culinary like i said i was i was working at the cheesecake factory i was serving like i you know i, I really just try to keep myself flexible and you know where i didn't always have to have like an office job like where i could still have freedom you know because because i'm still recovering like keep in mind like during this mindset like i had nothing i had finished chemotherapy for two years as yeah. an 18 year old. So I'm 21, 22, you know, and then finally getting into this, this, this condition that I'm now 26, I'm about to ride across the United States and, um, you know, doing that and, and figuring the logistics of that and seeing how, how, how well I did. I mean, from one stretch during that ride, I did, we did seven, we did seven centuries in seven days. We did, That's I think awesome. it was, Albuquerque to Amarillo in seven days. Wow. That or is so like impressive. That. So, something like that. Like 97, 120, 113, 112, um, 100, 100, 106. One, it was just like, okay, like I'm in. <laughs> Count me in. <laughs> um, and that was like, 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 mind you, like before then I had like the longest day was like 45 miles. Like that's a huge jump. F- oh, dude. For, day one was 67. Yeah, and my longest ride to that point was 45, and it was going through. It was it was pretty much it was 67 miles of climbing. Yeah, that's a hard start. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> because that's either like I'm done or all I'm all in. <laughs> it's one or the other. Yeah, <laughs> and I decided to go all in, and then yeah, so that was that was in 2012. Um, I had come back, had no job, I sold everything for that for that ride. Um, a lot of promises that were given to me by sponsors at that time didn't, didn't fall through. And so it was all right. I mean, I went back to serving. I went back to that process. Um, I eventually got a, got a job at a cycling shop, which eventually phased me over to start working specifically in bikes. Um, I ended up working at a Trek shop. So I got very familiar with the Trek brand. Um, I ended up becoming their salesperson of the year um was went to mexico like got really good at selling bikes like really good (laughs) and um i was just like okay like i like this stuff this is this is great and health was good mind you health is good like this is this is a a couple years in and this was probably 2015 2016 so things are going well health is going well and then um i ended up getting a job in the medical marijuana industry and, um, just fell in love with share again, sharing my story. Um, I was, I was trying to help patients understand that they had an alternative to their medications because I had learned at that time, a lot of the people I would, would, would go back when I would have my treatments and I would visit seeing old nurses, seeing old people, like, like people are always looking like, I can't take pills anymore. I can't take pills. And so like, I, I was a big proponent of, of being a patient to constantly exercise your right to find out what's going to allow you to live your life without pain, without, without, you know, anything. So that was, that was something that I was consulting with. And I really, I found out at that point that I really like helping people. Like I really like helping people overcome um, anything. And if I could offer any level of advice or, or, or direction that that was what I felt my, my life's goal or my life's work was at that time was to help out. And so we're getting closer. Everything's, you know, I was, getting successful there. And then one random day I was, um, getting ready for making myself a steak at my, at my old apartment with my ex-girlfriend and uh, she was a vegetarian. So whenever she was not home, I took it, took advantage of, uh, <laughs> tomahawks and thick pieces of bacon. And, <laughs> and, um, so I remember eating the meal and, and going outside to throw everything out and couldn't lift my arm. I'm like, okay, something's going on here and started feeling pain in the left part of my, of my jaw. I'm like, what is going on here? It's getting worse and worse. And, uh, got to the point where I couldn't speak. I, I was having a sh- shooting pain in the, in the center of my chest going towards the left part of my chest. And in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, let's go through this. Like, what have I, like, what am I missing? Like go through my, you know, my little Rolodex of like, like life health experiences. Okay. This is not cancer. I can tell that. Um, this kind of feels like when I thought I was having a heart attack. Okay. Um, left part, this, I'm like, I think I'm having a heart attack. Ended up texting my ex-girlfriend, texting my little brother at the time. And, um, at that point I'm like, get here as soon as possible. I don't know what's going on. You need to get here. And, by the time that they got here, I got all dressed up in my comfortable 
hospital attire, um, charge my phone, you know, literally had my sweats on and slippers, like, like, like just because that's what I did in the past. Like, that's what I would do when I knew I had to go somewhere, specifically hospital wise. I just got comfortable. <laughs> I knew I might not be going anywhere for a while. So I'm like, let's go. And I, so I get on, so I, so I get into the living room area and I'm sitting down and I just remember saying to myself, stay awake, stay awake. Don't, don't lay down. Don't close your eyes, stay awake. And as I was like saying that they walk in and I'm like tipping over, like legitimately tipping over. And so they rushed me to the hospital and they confirmed that I indeed had, I was going through a heart attack. And so, um, that, that day, that night, actually, they ended up having to wheel me down to get an angiogram, which is, um, if you're not familiar, and for the viewers, it's a test where they insert a camera into the artery of your arm, and it goes into your heart, so they could see inside of your heart. Yes, yeah, it <laughs> it's sounds painful. very, very painful. And so I'm awake. I'm not fully, I'm not fully awake, but I'm awake that I could he- hear them. They could talk to me, and I could talk back. Um, I was, it was definitely a blur, but I felt, I felt a lot of it. And they said, to did me, you feel like, like the actual pain or just a lot of discomfort? Oh no, no. I felt, I felt the camera going into the artery. Oh, that makes me I, cringe. I felt it dangling in my heart. Yeah. Um, <sighs> anyway, so they had confirmed that there was a golf ball sized blood clot in the left ventricle of my heart that we were going through a, the, the opposite of a traditional heart attack. So like most heart attacks blow up because your heart rate goes so high because you have high, you know, you have a lot of um, like your, your arteries and your veins are constricted because of plaque or whatever. In this case, my heart was coming to a stop because my chemotherapy treatments from almost 10 years previous had permanently damaged the structure and my heart. So that clot that formed in the left ventricle of my heart was was residue and, and, you know, blood, blood pieces over, over time that as my function was decreasing more and more, it was just catching it and getting bigger and getting bigger and getting bigger to where my infraction rate, which is the amount of percentage that your heart is pumping blood to the rest of your body was like in single digits, which is, it's not good. Yeah. So, um, that had confirmed that that was the cause of my heart attack. And that I would have to get either um, they tried to get rid of the clot with medication or what, which was, that was the start. And then the other option was to get a open heart surgery to implant an LVAD. So a left ventricle assist device that would be implanted in the left ventricle of my heart that would have to be powered to an external power source in order to keep my heart pumping at that point. So it's considered a bridge to transplant. So the open heart surgery was to remove that clot. We put this pump in. When I'm home, I'd be plugged into a power cord with about a 12 and a half foot, maybe 13 foot wire cord that I had to stay within that vicinity of where that, that cord was. And then whenever I needed to leave the house, I'd have to connect myself to VHS size batteries that would connect to that device that would keep me alive. I had to be on blood thinners at this point. They told me I would never ride my bike again um, because of how at risk I was by living with this device. They had to make sure that the viscosity of the blood was thin enough to go through the pump so it wouldn't catch and create more, more, like more blood clots. So that was my life for six months. But I knew that, that at some point that I would have to get a heart transplant because I could not live with this LVAD forever. Um, and six months later there was a clicking sound. Like I had a normal day and was waking up and I was, wi- I was, uh, I was awoken by a click. I'm like, I hear, like, where is that sound coming from? And it was coming from my pump. And it turned out that there was a malfunction in, in the pump, which I didn't know, but I was, I was, I went to the hospital. They kept me for 26 days. Um, and they wouldn't let me leave because they didn't know where the clot was until they found out that the clot was actually in the pump. So, my options were we need to take out this pump and you get to choose between either getting another open heart surgery to implant an LVAD or get another open heart surgery to receive a heart transplant. So <laughs> not good choice. <laughs> yeah. Those are um, two pretty tough Two ones. really intense surgeries that are the same, but one would, would equate to never having to have cords 
So I would get a level of, of freedom again, because you, you're literally a freedom of yourself. Uh, I mean, you're, you're a prisoner of yourself when you have an LVAD because you can't really go out because if that cord is pulled out of you by accident, or if you drop, if someone drops water on me, or if it's raining, um, I can, I can get electrocuted because it's, it's legitimately that a power insane. source. Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. I'll send you photos and stuff. It's insane. Um, wow. and so that was, that, 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 that was what was keeping me alive, but I knew that that would at some point give me the need to have to get a heart transplant. So what I ended up doing was I ended up finding out that there was a guy in Japan who was able to reverse his LVAD. So he got healthy enough that they took the LVAD out and did not have to put another one and did not have to have a heart transplant. So that was what, what was motivating me. I'm like, I could do that too. So I had gotten active. I would walk up and down stairs like seven days a week. I would walk, I would do everything in my power to get that heart like healthy, but not too healthy where I would hurt myself, you know? And so six months after that, um, I had gone for like a blood test, like that, that clicking sound. And they're like, you need to stay here. Like you need to stay here. We need to get rid of this clot. And, um, the day that they finally got rid of the clot was the day that I received the call for the heart transplant. Wow. So my last Perfect day timing. of being in the hospital, I got that call. So um, as we were mentioning before, um, I did have a podcast while I was waiting for the heart um, because I just felt that giving people an insight of a couple different things, not just what it's like to be a unhealthy young person. It was more to show and to, for those that have freedom, that have health, that have nothing wrong with their bodies, nothing wrong with their lives to a certain extent to really focus on being grateful for what you have. Because even at that moment, I had still been able to recognize that I was lucky to be in the position that I was because if I didn't have good, good, good family, good friends, access to good healthcare, I wouldn't be in that position in the first place either. So it was, it was, it was a combination podcast. It was called the so sick podcast. Um, Cause I would try to make it where it's like so sick, but not, but he is so sick. Um, so it would fit really well. But, um, but yeah, it was, it, it was to help me pass the time. Of course I had long days of doing nothing. Um, I was the youngest guy on the floor, of course. I mean, you know, I was at that time I was 30, 30 turning. I turned 33 in the hospital. So I was 33 at that time. And yeah, that, that, that was, um, the day that I got the call was the day that they told me I was going home. So like, wow. okay, well we have good news. We have bad news. I got packed up. They're like, you're going home. Like I got packed up with like four minutes and they're like, all right. But like, like the, like the room phone went off. They're like, we have good news. We have bad news. I'm like, all right, tell me the good news. Uh, don't, don't, I'm like, please tell me the bad news. They're like, well, you're not going home. I'm like, I'm like really <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like I just packed up, you know how hard it is to re-unpack, <laughs> but then you're like, but we found your heart. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I will say as long as I need to, <laughs> what do you need? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was where that day started and ended. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I, uh, I'm just really curious about your heart attack. Yeah. So what did that feel? I mean, I know you said your mm -hmm. left arm was was like not movable and then your face and everything but like what did that feel like because you said you had an opposite kind of like a reverse heart attack or whatever was it really was it painful or what what did it feel like it was painful it was absolutely painful um days and weeks leading up to that time frame i was definitely overworking myself but the problem was is that that's what i thought so i thought i was overworking myself when i had initially been diagnosed that I had that. And I was talking to the doctors and the physicians at the time, like telling them like what was going on leading up until that point. They said to me, they're like, you're 32 years old. You shouldn't be tired. You should not feel like you're overwhelmed. Like you shouldn't feel like you're overworking yourself at 32. So that made me think, I'm like, wow, I, I never would have known that. How would I have known that if I would never gone to have, had to have a heart attack? So it was, it was a trip because it was painful. It was leading up. I thought it was just me t being tired. I thought I was just tired. I thought I just had overworked myself. Um, I thought I was just not getting enough sleep. I thought I was just not prioritizing rest and, and um, you know, recovery as much as I should have at that time. Um, but overall, I feel it was pain. It was pain. It was fear. But it was also like, okay, you know, I've been through cancer. Nothing's worse than that. 
I was lucky enough to have that like in the back part of my head of saying like, you've been through cancer, man. You had two and a half years of chemotherapy. You rode across the country. You'll be okay. Whatever this is, <laughs> if it's not chemo, if it's not cancer, you're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that, like I was lucky enough to have that to compare it to because a lot of people like that's what I was using to be able to diagnose my, not diagnose, but at least try to figure out what was going on inside of myself. Yeah. So it sounds like had that not happened, like, had you not kind of ever worked yourself, it still probably would have happened, but just later. I would have, I would have, I would have dropped that. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Because, because I mean the, the clot. So the, the way that they show you, they say that your heart is about the same size as your fist. So the size of the clot was like the entire, this area over here. Oh my goodness. So like at some point it would it like it would just keep on getting bigger and bigger to the point where I would pro- what what would end up happening if it wasn't diagnosed is I would probably would have a stroke and just drop dead because the left ventricle goes up into the brain. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where that would would have gone if I if any of that clot would have broke off too. So that's a big thing too. They were on stroke watch for me because when we were waiting for that medication to work before I had the open heart surgery to remove it, I was not able to like out like even when i needed to use the bathroom they made me like they get they, they had the little can that i had to use um they didn't want me moving with that like because if i moved at all if i did anything that was too quick they were concerned that that might like dislodge a piece of that clot in my left ventricle and give me a stroke oh my goodness that is yeah. i mean it's nuts. a blessing that absolutely you, nuts <laughs> yeah it's a blessing that it was it kind of played out the way it did 100 percent, so that you could like get diagnosed with it, but right. it's kind of scary to think about if had mm-hmm. it not been diagnosed. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm very simple minded with this stuff. Like, I don't know anything about it. I'm Good. only no, <laughs> yeah, I'm only keep it asking, that way. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully knock on wood, but yeah, I'm asking questions based off of knowledge that I think I have. Mm-hmm. So if I ask a question and it's dumb, I apologize, but what is the process of getting a heart transplant because I know like from the movies and from TV shows and stuff, it seems like it's a very difficult process. Like you have to get for one, you have to get approved. You have to get on the list. Then you have to get approved and prove that like, which is kind of weird to think about that you're healthy enough to accept it. So what, what does that whole process look like? You know, a lot more than you think you do. That's very, very close to what the process is. So, um, the process is, so when I, when they determined that I had that clot, right. So that during when I was in, when I had that sound, that, that clicking sound, um, and they had decided to keep me making me decide, um, that I had to either get another LVAD or get a heart transplant. Once I made that decision, they started putting me through the, through the process of getting prepared to be listed. So there's a bunch of tests, panels, um, from all aspects of your life, because exactly like you said, not everybody has the wherewithal to be able to have that surgery because there's a, you need a support system. You need people to live with you. You need people to have flexibility. You need someone among your family to change your bandages. You need someone to be your driver. You need to, you need to be sitting in the back seat. Um, you need to alert the fire department that you have this device. So if there's power losses, um, they can come to get you first to make sure that you have power to power your, your devices. Wow. Um, I didn't know about that. That's kind of Oh, crazy. there's everything. It makes sense, but wow, that's mm-hmm. crazy. There's a psychological test. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's antibody tests. So for someone like myself who had leukemia, I had tons of blood transfusions. Um, the amount of antibodies that you have in your blood will dictate how many, um, donors you would be potentially able to get from. So depending upon your blood type, but then also your blood transfusion, blood, um, your blood history really, um, of how, and first off, what blood type you can get, what the, the heart had to be from someone the same exact size as you. So that's male or female that's black or white. Um, what else is there? There's, uh, but the biggest thing is the antibodies because I had tons of transfusions as a leukemia patient. And so they were really concerned about me not being able to accept as many hearts because of that background. But when they did my antibody test, I had zero, which was insane. 
So any heart that came up, I was I was eligible to, to get. Um, but then once you get so once you go through that panel, that's when they decide to list you. And that's when they decide to put you in a certain position on that list. So I was able to get put since I was in good physical shape, but I was stuck in the hospital. They looked at that as being on top of the list because this guy is in the hospital. He can't leave until he either gets a heart or he dies. That's 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 the position I was in. But I was physically and emotionally prepared. If I did get it, I checked all the boxes that I'd be able to go home after that surgery and go through a, a the proper recovery to properly take my medication to properly see the doctor as often as I needed to 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 because you have to follow the rules you have to be compliant you can't be one of those people that say oh I don't believe in it you can't do that <laughs> yeah you're not gonna get it uh, you're not gonna get anything <laughs> trust <laughs> me it's not a good thing to do um, you had to have all your vaccines um, but yeah so there's pieces of that that um, that make it very for some people like they, they, they can't do it. And some, some, I, I have been lucky enough that I really have never been a big TV person. So I don't really don't know what I've, what people have seen, but what you've said is very close. Um, it's very, very close to that process. You big, the biggest picture. And that's really from the first open heart surgery, which again, I had an open heart surgery just six months before. So I knew what that recovery process was going to look like. So everything that I could have like as bad of a position that I was in, cause I was in a bad position to need a new heart. I was in good enough position that I had that experience to go off of that was only six months prior and that I had chemotherapy b- before. So I had, I knew what was coming with this surgery. I knew what to prepare for with whatever I needed to do. So I was in a very good position to receive that heart. And so, but the, but the biggest problem with the heart um, procurement process is that you don't find out that you're getting a heart until the day of. So dang, that's like my door is closed lottery, but kind of oh, scary too. Oh, I mean, and it's even weirder too, because my birthday is in February. My birthday is February 21st. So the weekend before my birthday was president's week. So when, what, <laughs> this is trippy people on the floor say, well, you know, it's a holiday weekend. We tend to have more situations come in. Okay. I hate to I say, can it. see that. Yeah. I hate to I say it, but that. that's. That's how, when you're in a position that I am, you needing, needing an organ from someone that's living, that is the only way it's going to happen. I can't get a heart from a dead person. Yeah, no, that. And I can't go get a heart through, through someone that has had drug related trauma. I can't go through, I can't get a heart that has had a certain level of trauma because then it's not going to work for me. So there has to be a certain accident. There has to be a certain process to that potential donor that works out for that. I mean, it's, tr- it's absolutely crazy, but that's, that's the closest that I can get to share it. I would say of that process, but the nerve wracking part is when um, you're just waiting. You don't know when, when it is all the nurses tell you, they prepare you. They're like, you don't expect to get that heart. Even if they, even if you got the call until you wake up and all those cords are out of you, because if that heart shows up and it's not in the condition that the doctors are looking for, they'll reject the heart and you'll just keep on waiting. Oh, that or is, someone else will get it or someone else. Will that get is that rough. That yeah. is such a, I didn't know about that. Like you get it the yeah. day of, because I feel, I mean, that is just a tough process. I mean, it makes sense, but yeah. it is, that is a tough process, especially, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big old baby. Like I had to <laughs> kind of get amped up to get my wisdom teeth out, like just yeah. to go to sleep and get yeah. my teeth out. But oh yeah, that'd be, I feel like I'd, need to get into the mentality of like, I'm about to go into surgery, like a serious surgery and like all yeah. that stuff, but to be like, Hey, we have your heart. You're going down in the operating room. Let's go. Like that yep. is, yep. you are such a strong individual. Like <laughs> you. you are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. After your heart transplant. Yeah. So you had the idea that you were going to bike across the country to go meet the family of the individual that you received the heart from. Mm-hmm. So what, I don't know if you can tell me any of this, but what did you know about that person and the heart transplant that you got from that person? Ooh, so this is the fun part. So um, based upon the the rules, there are rules. Um, you're not supposed to reach out to the donor's family within six months of receiving the heart um, because six months is a very early time frame to even think about it. 
but I had established before I received the heart saying that at some point I'd like to have some sort of communication with them. It didn't have to be, you know, traditional, could have been just in letters, could have been just emails. It could have been nothing at all, but I wanted them to know that their heart was in a good place, that, that I had their son's heart um, or that I had their daughter's heart. And so um, I had to have that box checked. And so when I got, when I got discharged March 12th, um, six, la- six weeks later, I received a letter from his family. Um, they sent me a letter and they, um, they sent me the letter and I wasn't ready. I, cause I was told six months and I had six weeks. I'm like, I don't, all right, well, I need, need more time. <laughs> I needed more time yeah. to figure this out. But once they reach out to me, I'm, that was when I went to, um, I started going to cardiac rehab, which is a, which is kind of much like a gym, fit, you know, physical therapy, but they, they just, they just monitor your heart the whole time. And I'm walking around all old people, everybody's on the treadmills. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, I'm stuck here with all these old people. Like, like, <laughs> what am I going to do? So like, I started doing what they told me to do. And then I started getting confidence. I started getting stronger. I started feeling better when I was doing physical activity. And there was a stationary bike in the corner. I'm like, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. <laughs> and then I went to the, the the physician. I'm like, I think I'm ready. I'm like, I think I could do it. So I asked them, like, could I, can I get on the bike? They're like, yeah, sure. So I started setting it up as if I was about to go on a bike ride. And now, mind you, this is a stationary bike. This is not even a spinning machine. It's an upright, like bulky beast. No clipless uh, options. I'm like, what is this? Like, what am I dealing with right here? <laughs> is it the one with the back on it too? Oh yeah, it's, it's awful. It's awful. Oh nice, awful, Perfect. awful, awful. <laughs> the <lounger>. um, <laughs> Yeah, and I did it. I'm like, I could do this. And then that was when I came up with the idea. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna ride to wherever my heart donor is, wherever his their uh, burial site, wherever that is. I'm gonna ride to it. And so I ended up finding out that he was a Navy flight surgeon. So I figured out it was going to be easier because when you're buried for the military, it's a lot easier to access where th- that cemetery is. And so I reached out to him. I'm like, listen, like, this is what I'm trying to do. You guys are more than welcome to meet me there if you'd like to. Um, but this is my plan. I'd like to visit his grave and I'd like to um you know, show my appreciation and thanks and, and, you know, kneel down on a knee and, and, and talk to him. And they said, no, we would love to meet with you as well. So that was when the planning started, you know, different media companies wanted to get involved. I was working with bicycling magazine on a feature. Um, I was working on um, trying to do a documentary to a certain extent and um, eventually ended up um getting everything planned to where I left the hospital that I um, was where I received the heart transplant and took the Southern route all the way through um, pretty much all through Texas and took the Southern route to get to, to Jacksonville national cemetery. Um, Yeah, it was, it was a trip because this is the first time I was riding that amount of distance again. Um, Again, I had, you know, I had muscle memory from the previous ride, but I had a new heart. So I had to, I had to change things up a bit. Um, I did not have the same amount of, of distance capacity as I'd preferred. Um, I had pills that I had to take. I had heart rates that I had to manage. So it took a lot longer, but I did it. And it was the biggest thing as a matter of like, I didn't care about my performance. It was more about just getting there. And then, you know, if I ever was in a position to do it again, I would do it a different way. But I wanted to just get there in one piece. Um, I wanted to meet his family. I wanted to show that his heart is in the right place. And I wanted them to be able to, um, I wanted them to be able to know that he's home and to listen to his heart. So I I brought a stethoscope and I allowed them to all listen to his heart. Yeah. I mean, they get to hear his heart again and like feel his heart again like that. Mm -hmm. That is such a special moment. Like what were the emotions that you were, I guess, feeling when you were over there. Cause I mean, from the outside looking in, if I was there, I would just be sobbing the entire time. Like that'd be such a special and memorable moment. And just, just for a family to know, like your son and or daughter mm-hmm. is still living in a sense, a piece of them is still living and giving life to someone else. 
Like that is so special. It's a trip because you're acknowledging that their worst day is your best day. Mm. And you, and you're managing wow. that because wow, that's, that, that's, that's pretty that's, heavy. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like you're able to continue doing your live streams and to do these things and their son is always not going to be there anymore. Um, so it was it was heavy. It was heavy. I mean, I, I I had guilt for a while. I still to a certain extent do on certain days of the year. Mother's Day is a hard day for me because um, I just recognize that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for another mother's son. Mm. Um, but then I recognize that I'm here for my mother. And so it's just trippy that my other you know, my, my heart donor's mother is not able to celebrate Mother's Day anymore, you know? So it's, it's, uh, it's forever, it's forever a battle. Um, I'm, I, I, I've accepted it because it's not my fault at the end of the day. Like that's a very hard thing to accept is it's not your fault. Um, cause I was willing, because it turned to a certain extent, you just kind of take it on your own, but you, but you also have to figure out how to manage yourself. Um, and, uh, it was it was amazing, but I was very I did I, I I ended up realizing later on that I did it for them more than I did it for myself. Like I, I I needed to have the closure for myself, but I feel that they had to have more closure to know that the person that's going to be moving forward with this person's heart is a good person. He's not abusing his heart. He's not drinking alcohol. He's not you know he's not pushing it to 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 its max extreme that it shouldn't be going to. You know doing you know, anything that shouldn't be done, vices of any sort, um, you know, negative activities, anything illegal. Like I, I just wanted to show them, I'm like, I'm a, this is who I am as a human being. Like, I don't do things the easy way. I don't do things, um, with myself as the focal point. I do it as an overall goal and I do it as an overall reason. And I hope that that is, um, able to be recognized by whoever is able to witness what I do. And, um, you know, to be, to be involved in anything that I do from, you know, whatever capacity that is, I feel is, is I'm just very, very grateful and it's permanently a level of gratefulness. Um, and just giving back whenever I could. And I felt that was the, the most incredible opportunity I could ever be given to thank his, his mom and to establish that, that, that connection and that relationship. I still talk to them um, from time to oh, time. Man, I message them. Another question. Yeah. yeah oh really no, we're in touch. That. Yeah, yeah, we're in touch. Um, not as much. I mean, you know, I have my own life and they have theirs. And but I, but I, I check in from time to time. They, they check in from time to time. Um, and over time, like you know, as the upcoming project that's coming up in a couple uh, in 2024, I'll, I'll be, I'll be seeing them again. So it's um, Maybe more often. Maybe I'll do more of these rides. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. maybe I'll have more excuses to get down there. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah, yeah. And so you kind of mentioned, for one, that's amazing. And you kind of opened up. I know for me personally, you've opened up my eyes just to think about how they would feel, like to make sure it went to the right person. Because I feel like if the family felt like it went to the wrong person, how much more difficult that would feel mm -hmm. be like it's like you're using a piece of my child or family member that i created correctly mm -hmm. yeah like that's that that would be a really hard thing to handle I agree. so yeah you you open my eyes to that but you mentioned that you had to keep your heart rate kind of between a certain level as you were getting out there mm -hmm. so what kind of, well like were you monitoring that yourself or did you mm -hmm. have like other medical professionals checking you randomly and stuff? Oh no, it was just me. Um, okay. I mean, I had a range that I tried to hit. Um, I was trying not to go beyond my max. I, I was, I was really just riding based upon heart rate. Um, and that kind of paced me. I mean, I wasn't in excellent shape, but I was in good enough shape that I could just finish the day's ride that I needed to do. Um, it was not easy. I mean, like I would say, it was, in, it was way easier than the first ride, <laughs> you know, going 3,168 miles in 38 days, averaging 97 miles a day, comparing to 1,426 miles in over six weeks, um, was a different experience. And I had some pieces of me that were like, oh, this is not really a real ride. Um, <laughs> like I want to do this better. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I, I mean, it was, it was overall, um, the heart rate process was just learning more about my heart. It was cause I, cause I only had the heart for about a year at that time. So I was still learning what it was capable of doing, like what's considered max. When do I feel that I'm at my max and what does that number say? Um, you know, cause there's a, 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 like one thing that I've learned is that my heart rate variability will never be accurate because when you get your heart taken out, the nerve, the autotomic nerve, uh, that connects to get your HRV numbers for me is never reattached. So I never have accurate HRV numbers. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Until, until at some point that might attach, then my numbers will become more consistent. But at this point, at, at the point of receiving the heart into this very day, um, I can't accurately monitor my HRV. So a lot of my heart rate is just seeing the number and then also associating to that to how I feel. If that makes so sense. do you think that, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think that with getting a heart transplant or any organ transplant, that it's more or less training that organ to work in your body or learning that organ in your body? Both. Yeah. I can't, wow. I mean, I can't speak for other organs. Um, I can only speak for the heart and I would say, I would say it's a combination of both because now the heart's in a new environment, but then you're, because that's the biggest part about the medication I have to take for the rest of my life is to, to prevent my heart from my body from attacking my, my heart, even though it's not my heart, because that's a foreign object. It's not my heart. So that's what the medication is there to do is to actually trick my immune system in thinking that that's my heart and that the other medication is the medication my body needs. Um, but, um, it's a combination of both. Like I think now I know my heart very, very well. That's why my intentions for my upcoming project are specific um, compared to before, where it was just a matter of me finishing the ride in one piece and not blowing up. But I was never putting myself to max heart rate anyway. I would only do that if I felt like I had to, um, but it would, but it'd be going up in increments of like one beat per minute. It wouldn't be like five or 10. It would be like, Oh, 164. Okay. Today I did 165. Okay. Today I did 167. Ooh, you need to calm down a little bit, but that's enough of, of progress where if I could feel better in those two beats, I can notice that regardless of what my monitors are telling me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's remarkable. That's yeah. great to know too. It's very intuitive. Yeah, that... It's a lot of intuitive uh, kind of mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I mean, yeah, it's just, this has been such a mind blowing conversation just mm -hmm. to think about having a new instrument, pretty much. You have mm -hmm. a new instrument in your body and you're used to doing things a certain way, but now you have to introduce that. And not only do you have to get it to where you were or want to go, but also you have to see the capabilities of that instrument as well. Exactly. Like that is, that is, it's just, it's wild. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so, well, I mean, with your rides, luckily you're not trying to do like fastest known time or anything like that. So you can just, yeah. I mean, those all day rides and stuff, <laughs> they are tough, yeah. but at least you can just hit your all day mm -hmm. zones right. and that's way, way better on your body. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So thus far. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to go into your project for 2024? Yeah, so this came out just a couple of days ago, um, probably well, I'd say mostly maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've been I've been trying to, so I've been I've been I would say since the end of my race season this year, I have decided that I wanted to start like, like this is so I did I did three events this year. I did the transplant games, I did the heart transplant games in San Diego. I came in third. Um, I did the the last best ride in Whitefish, Montana. It was my first um, Pacific Northwest um, gravel ride. I did I did gravel locos last year in in Hico, Texas, Hico, Texas, and then I did the Mammoth Grand Fondo. And so I noticed how I finish each of the races, and I'm like, I want to do this better. I want to be better prepared. <laughs> um, I need to get my logistics better. I want to make sure that. Um, I build muscle because I've only been really training just by the bike. I really haven't, um, put too much time in the gym, which I decided that this year I'm going to be doing the opposite. And I want to start becoming stronger. 
And what I mean by stronger is not just to be able, like, I'm never going to actually compete. I'm never going to be in the Peloton. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be drafting behind like, you know, Pete Stetna or Casey McKelvin or, <laughs> you know, Yuri Hawswald. I mean, sorry. Like, I, I don't know if I have that engine yet, but I want to start getting to the point where, you know, I'm not like top hundred, maybe I'm like 99, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like maybe I could, maybe I could just start seeing what I'm capable of doing. So I, I've determined I'm going to fully change, transform my, my entire training routine, uh, training, food mindset. Like I'm going to a healer after this, um, like just, just to dial everything in, you know? And so I figured, I'm like, you know what? Like it was actually my brother's idea. He's like, why don't we do the same ride again that we did in 20, in 2019 and, but this time do it as fast as possible this time. Um, cause I have a camper, I have a truck. Um, obviously I, I'm, I'm working with Canyon. Um, I have access to a lot more, a lot of different platforms this time around. Um, and I want to see what I can do. So I'm pl- planning on doing, uh, riding from Sulpizio, the same hospital where I received my heart transplant to, the Jacksonville National Cemetery to go visit James again. This time there's not as much emphasis on, um, you know, uh, meeting his family. They're going to be there. They're going to be, I'm, I know for sure, because it's not far from where they live. But uh, the more focus this time around is just the overall performance part. Like I'm really curious to see if I could start adding um, more endurance athlete type of stuff um, because I like the endurance part. I like the, the process. I like that I can kind of manage my my efforts a little bit better. Um, I don't know yet about shorter distances yet. That might change as my training is kind of progression. But overall, I want to see what I'm capable of doing. And since I already have that 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 route, pretty much all all the logistics are set up. It's just a matter of time and preparation. Um, we're gonna just do it again and. This time around, we're going to, by having Canyon involved this time around, I mean, I'm trying to, um, I'm going to have access to an e-bike. Uh, we could mount like maybe six or seven GoPros all over the bike and get really good B-roll and really good footage. Um, uh, maybe vehicle wraps. I mean, just different things that I didn't do last time that I was more time constrained for. Uh, yeah. This time I want to be more more dialed in for. Um, yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm also launching a, a concept that's called Flint, F-L-N-T. And um, it is pretty much my whole life. My, my dad's always, um, throughout all my health issues, my dad has always says, you know, the fire inside you has never gone out. You know, I've always seen you fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And it just, it resonated to me that, to me, my, what started my fire, I feel, or what least made me recognize that I had something special inside me was the cancer. And I've always looked at the cancer as being what started my fire of looking to give back, looking to help, looking to use whatever platform that I'm developing into a way to, to help others in that, in that simultaneous progression. So what Flint is, it's going to be a concept that generates money and funding for individuals from the age of 18 to 37 because I'm 37 um, and help them financially through their cancer um, and or their heart related diagnosis. And the way that we're going to do that is by contributing funds directly to GoFundMe's. So we can't directly go to individual patients because that's protected by HIPAA. Um, But the best possible way is for those that are their family members and friends that have created GoFundMe's to help people pay for the treatments, I want to be able to start covering those costs. And the way I figure to be able to do that is by selling merchandise, um, by having people pledge a certain amount of money per mile or whatever that is, and that money will be generated to fund the the projects and at the same time, um, you know, start contributing those funds to start helping getting these GoFundMe campaign goals to be either not necessarily completed. I mean, I'm going to try to get them all completely funded. Um, Why not? Because that would be the best possible, you know, scenario, but at the minimum, if I could contribute a certain amount of money to get them that much closer to that goal, and then maybe just have access to constantly feeding their campaign that this is happening. They're still going through this. We need to help them in any way we can. My rides will generate 
stickers and 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 photos and hats and merch and all that stuff. So um, it's just a simultaneous um, launch, I would say, that is inspired by my desire to see what I'm now capable of five years later after my first ride. Yeah, I mean, I I've only known you face to face for just a little over an hour, but I can definitely tell <laughs> just from your story and your mentality and stuff like you, once again, you're not one to take anything laying down. Like no. you're no. going to, you're going to go headstrong into it. And I think that's a great, great characteristic. Thank you. So, I mean, with Flint, please reach, I will be in contact about that because I want to help out in any way okay. I can. And I want to support you on the adventure in 2024 as well, because that's, I mean, as I've told others and probably on other episodes of the podcast of like, with this podcast, it's kind of a selfish, like it's selfish for me because I like having these conversations and meeting really cool people. Yeah. But also it's, I want to give back to the cycling community because I've taken so much from the cycling community. I want to give back. And so I think when there's a give and take, it's so much more special. And that's obviously what you're trying to do. Like Mm -hmm. you're honestly, I think you're giving more (laughs) than (laughs) taking. So it's just, thank you. I, 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 I'm like, I'm very happy to have you on this podcast and to get your message out because it's just very special. You know, I totally appreciate that. And, um, I mean, this cycling world has given me so much, uh, the community, the, the, the constant inspiration, um, you know, hearing stories. I mean, you know, just listening to your podcast and listening to people you've had on and, you know, I mean, some of the other ones that I've been on, it's, it's, it constantly just makes me grateful that I have something to contribute, um, to listeners, to riders, to athletes, to patients, to individuals that are just not sure where their life is going. You know, I mean, I, I just have been very unlucky in my life, but like you said, like, I feel like I need to give more than I'm taking because I've, I've, I've received a lot in my life. Um, lucky enough that I have a lot to receive from my friends and my family. And it took me a long time to establish community because of how long I've been recovering and working on getting myself back. Like I've had three comebacks, you know, I've had three life, life threatening, you know, experiences in my life and I'm 37. And like, I really never have established a community that's not, you know, patient related or diagnosis related. And it's something that's fun centric and it's, it's, it's inspiring centric and adventure centric and, um, new brand new and new memories. Like that's my goal. It's like, I had, I had said when I was waiting for the heart, like I'm looking to take the next 32 years of my life and make them the opposite, the complete opposite of what I just lived. You know, I want to live outside. I want to be outside. I want to have access to being outside because I spent so much time looking at a hospital wall you know, for months of my life. And not to say that months is a big deal, but, you know, when you're 18 and all your friends are, you know, going to school and experiencing, you know, what it's like to live in college and and, and dorm life and all that stuff. And, you know, where you're building your friendships and building who you are as a human being. I didn't have that. I was, I was, you know, I was at home. I was, I was, you know, managing a life threatening experience, a life threatening disease. And I feel that now that I'm a part of the cycling community, in so many capacities, I can now be a, just part, just another part of that community, but that has a, a little unique story that just makes me a little different than the other person, I would say. You know, I think that everybody at the end of the day, because what I see when I see what is cycling, um, I see is like a perspective of what that is to that individual. And I look at cycling for me as meditative. I look at cycling for me as like a level of recovery, but also a source of adventure, also a source of inspiration. Like it's everything. And I'm like, if I can give someone that is just new to cycling and is, that are that are listening to this podcast or coming to to Canyon to look for a bike, like if I can give them another reason to love the bike that they're about to jump on, um, to invest in um, time and money. Uh, I'm very grateful to, to have contributed to that. Like that's, that's my goal is to give back in every capacity of whatever I get myself into. So thank you yeah, very like, much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're the same person in that concept. Cause it's like, I'm the same way. Cycling is very meditative. Like mm-hmm. um, it just allows me, it gets me into God's creation and it just gives me quiet time and alone mm-hmm. time. But also you cover so much distance, like you, like the adventure aspect, you can go and see mm-hmm. so much on the bike mm-hmm. and it's just, there's, hardly anywhere that you can't go on bike. I mean, yeah. 
I guess, in the water. But other than that, you can walk across it. So, yeah, hey, uh, I mean, you can get a ship and ride across it as you're riding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put it on a trainer. Yeah. But yeah, so it's it's great to hear that. So, I, yeah, I mean, once again, thank you for being on this podcast and sharing your story because it's been so remarkable. And I'm very excited for everyone to hear this because it's I I hate it for everyone else that they don't get to hear it live like I do. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's great. Thank you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, man. And I have, I love to come back on. I mean, even when we're getting closer to uh, the, I mean, the ride and logistics, I could definitely give you like an update and give you like a whole like plan where we're going and what the plan is. And, you know, if it all works, maybe we could meet up. I mean, who knows? I mean, I'm trying to get Canyon to get really deeply involved with this project. Um, I'm going to get a, a very solid summary getting uh, deck and presentation pretty soon. And um, I'm trying to get at least them knowing what's going on by the end of the year. So we have a full year, almost two years to get it planned to be like dialed. So oh, perfect. Um, yeah. it, it, it's going to be a way different experience than last time. I can say that. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I want to be as involved as I can be. So Done. you let me know what you need and I'll be there. Done for sure. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. Thank you so much.